Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I, you know, everybody that knows me well, you know we're going to do this again <laughs> and again until we get it right. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. All right, thank you. I think part of this is a good afternoon. Part of this is, can you stop her? Um, so I'm so pleased that you've joined us this afternoon um, for our program and our leadership forum. We're joined by uh, faculty, staff, students, really from across our medical school and our teaching hospitals, from our dental school, from our School of Public Health, but also from UMass Boston and Boston College. So welcome to today's program. I'm pleased to introduce to you Dr. Alicia Perez Tabla, who's going to give us a talk today on advancing the health agenda for diversity populations. This is your time. And I would say this is actually all of our time within this. Um, he is the director of the National Institutes of Health, uh, National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities. And in this role, he seeks to advance the science of minority health and health disparities through research, training, advancing research capacity and research capacity development, public education, and information dissemination. His research interests include improving the health of racial and ethnic minorities and underserved populations advancing patient-centered care, improving cross-cultural communication skills among clinicians, and promoting diversity in the biomedical research enterprise. For more than 30 years, he led research on Latino smoking cessation and tobacco control policy in the United States and Latin America, and on addressing clinical and prevention issues in cancer screening and mentoring over 70 minority investigators. Um, I am so pleased that he's joined us here today. Um, and I'm so pleased that he's actually the head of this institute at NIH. I don't think we could have found anyone better for that role. Dr. Perez Stava. Thank you, Joan. And, and thank you for having invited me. It's a real uh, pleasure and honor to be here uh, to do this presentation. I actually targeted this thinking about uh, the next generation. So, uh, and this is a talk that I'm going to do more, a little bit of a personal trajectory, a little bit of the big picture, and or NIMHD in the big picture, <clears throat> and, uh, and some lessons. So uh, hopefully uh, it'll be uh, entertaining, not too boring. So um, many of you who know me know that I'm an immigrant, and I came from Cuba. Uh, this is a map of the island. There was a, a very upper middle class, middle class. Uh, this is a, a photo of, uh, of my father's side of the family. Um, this is my father here. He was a physician in Cuba. And I'm this little guy over here with a mean face and my two sisters and my, and my mother. Um, and um, uh, the Cuban Revolution disrupted the, the family. Uh, I immigrated to, Cuba, to uh, Miami at the age of eight. My father was 40. He restarted his career, remade his career in the U.S., and actually worked in the VA uh, for his whole academic career. Uh, so immigration really shaped my life. And now I can sort of intellectualize it and think about the stressors I had uh, as a non-English speaking third grader in Miami. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, uh, when I got to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, um, I learned English very quickly because uh, there was uh, no, no other option. Um, so I, it's always my excuse when I don't speak correctly. I say it's my second language. You know, get, cut, me, cut, me, cut me some uh, slack. Um, I went to public schools, uh, parochial and then public schools. Uh, and because my father was a physician in academic medicine, he was really my role model. And I still remember <clears throat> um, it was at the University of Miami Medical School and uh, after two years, you start the clinical rotations. And he was going to, uh, he always attended on the wards in the VA in July, because he liked to do it early in the year. And so my first rotation, just by chance, was medicine. And my first site was going to be the VA. So I said to the director, he says, I want to be on his team. And they looked at me and go, are you sure? He goes, yeah, yeah, I want to be on his team. And so they let me be on his team. Of course, now they would never allow that, right? <laughs> and it was great. It was one of the, one of the best decisions I ever made in sort of uh, viscerally, because uh, I learned so much from him uh, that I still carry with me for many decades. So 
Um, I matched at UCSF, so I went west and stayed there for 37 years. And uh, after doing a research fellowship, uh, joined the faculty at, um, at UCSF and focused on social, clinical, and population science and worked with scientists from different disciplines. I ended up at NIH <clears throat> after all this time, uh, after having met many of the standard metrics of success of academic researchers. Uh, I was full professor by 1996. I had an R01 at age 35. Um, I was elected or selected to ASCI. I was, uh, I was a general internal medicine division chief in 1999 and was in that job when I left. I was elected to the Institute of Medicine. I had this opportunity at NIH, which I couldn't pass up. It was like, well, if I, I, was on, had, I had known people at the NIH, I wasn't sort of like, oh, this is the greatest place to work. But then I, I was on the NIA Council, uh, the National Institute on Aging Council, and I got to m see what the NIH did more from the inside because um, of the time I spent there, uh, three meetings a year, three days a year, three, three days each meeting. And so I, I, I thought that was a real opportunity to really have uh, leverage. And so when that came up and it, it was offered to me, I was ready to take it. And there were two things that drove it. One was the advancing the science and having this opportunity at the national level, the national stage, to move the needle uh, in the field uh, in a way that uh, from UCSF, no matter how many grants I had or uh, the talks you gave or the people you worked with uh, was more, was different than doing it at the national stage. And the other was to have a seat at the table. As one of the people on, that I knew at the NIH at NCI, Bob Coyle, uh, talked to me on the phone uh, in between my, my two visits. He said, you know, if, you, if you're there as the director of NIMHD, you actually are sitting there with the NCI director, with the NCLBI director, with the director of NIH, and you have a seat at the table, and there is influence there, and you represent a, a lot of the perspectives, and people will listen. And he was right. Uh, it is a very much of part of a, of a group of directors where you have that opportunity. Um, and so I, I think it's... Uh, it's an opportunity. It's two years into it, so so far I'm okay. Um, and some some people say, well, what have you learned after being in government for this time? And um, I'll say that government is more efficient than people think. Uh, in some ways, more efficient than academics. <laughs> Uh, but they share that bureaucracy and slowness and stuff. It's just different in different uh, There is a big difference in hierarchy in government. Uh, there is a lot more top-down culture. And the idea that faculty can do what they want and, you know, they more or less have to fall in line on certain things within certain uh, boundaries uh, doesn't exist in government. In government, the director wants what uh, one, one, somebody said, well, if you want the, the ceiling painted green and you say it, the next day it'll be green. Uh, it's a little bit of a joke, but it, you get, there is real hierarchy. And I think for me, that was, that's been the, 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 the thing to, you know, uh, to, to manage the most in terms of learning how to implement that. So it's kind of fun to have that kind of power sometimes, but you also have to be measured in how you do it because I do want people to disagree with me and engage and be engaged. And so that's been the more balancing act for me. Um, this is uh, all national politics. Institutes, for many of you know, but are like autonomous republics. <laughs> we get our appropriations. Yes, the director of the NIH tells us stuff, but we each have our own agenda, and it, you have to kind of move everybody together or separately. Um, it's not like an automatic uh, thing. So I, I think that is uh, not as, and, and we do interact and collaborate more than I think than used to be in the past. There's a tremendous passion for science. The mission of the place is very clear, and that's just visible from the highest level to the most basic level and the most uh, of uh, staff at NIH. I think for a government agency that ha probably has a, one of the higher levels of engagement and commitment and that it's clear where the direction and the mission of the agency is and there's strong collaborative spirit. And I think that in the last 20 years, um, the mission of NIMHD, so the recognition of minority health and health disparities, has kind of landed. I think the other directors, if, if uh, in the 1990s, it was sort of, do we need this? Is this really necessary? Other institutes do it. 
uh, in the 2000s, it was, okay, what does this mean? How do we fit? Who fits? Now it's sort of like all the receptor sites are open. And the other, uh, most of the other institutes are ready to collaborate, and we're ready to collaborate with them. So our history goes back to 1990, when uh, the office was established under Secretary Sullivan, uh, founded this in the office of the director, and John Ruffin was named director of that office uh, and stayed until he retired in 2014. In 2000, we were elevated to a center uh, through legislation, and that's really the critical change because being a center allowed us to have a grant program and to give out grants. Uh, prior to that, the office basically provided funding for others' grants, much like the Office of Behavioral and Social Science Research or the Office of Women's Health Research uh, and, and others that exist in, uh, in, a, in the Office of the Director at NIH. And then as part of the ACA in 2010, we were moved up to an institute. Um, and the arrangement was in the uh, National Center for Research Resources was dissolved. Uh, NCATS was created, uh, the National Center for uh, Translational Sciences, uh, and then uh, NIMHT became an institute as opposed to a center. And I started in September of uh, 2015. Um, in defining and thinking about minority health and health disparities, the two parts of our name, uh, minority health is anything and everything that relates to the census categories of uh, race ethnic minorities in the U.S. And in, in specifically, we're interested in diseases or conditions or outcomes that are actually better than their white referent group uh, because there's no disparity. Uh, so you can't call it disparities just because it's minority populations. Uh, and understanding those mechanisms and how to maintain that in some cases is an important scientific question for us as an institute. We also uh, came to a consensus or have a consensus um, and articulated it, that all race ethnic minorities share a social disadvantage related to discrimination. That all of these populations, all of, uh, have been subject to historical discrimination in the U.S. A varying degree. Uh, there's nothing like the wars against American Indians in the, for many hundreds of years or the legacy of slavery that we live with today, continue to live with today. Uh, but all minority groups have been subject to discrimination, and we believe that disparity populations are in a similar uh, context. You're familiar with the OMB categories. Um, if not, you should. <laughs> we fill out uh, every 10 years. This is the official terminology, and I'll just make a couple of comments. Uh, the census is flexible with name. They do capitalize black and white. Um, most people don't, and journals don't. Asian is potentially problematic because it's very heterogeneous. Uh, South Asians really don't belong in the Asian race category uh, by any anthropological or genetic uh, data that we have, but they're there and it doesn't look like it's going to change. American Indian Alaska Native are, of course, a small and important uh, minority group. Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander are not Asian and they frequently are lumped together with Asian slash PI and it's wrong. And we do it at NIH still in terms of like cancer registries, so you see these uh, reported. They should be separated out. They're small, of course, except in Hawaii, and then you, there's a sizable population in California, but other than that, they're really hard to, they're a small population to find. And then Latino or Hispanic um, is the only ethnic group that's recognized. It's 20 countries, uh, heterogeneous, but I think has enough common bonds to categorize as one group. Whites include people from the Middle East and North Africa, uh, which is not something widely uh, accepted by those populations. And there is a proposal by the census to change to another ethnic group called MENA, Middle Eastern North African, uh, that would happen in 2020. In that case, they also are abandoning the two-part questionnaire, are you Hispanic, Latino, and then ask for race, and just ask straight up uh, what group do you identify with and offer the menu, as you see it here, if it goes through with uh, Middle Eastern North Africa as an option. I, I would like to see them do the same thing with South Asians, but they, it, it doesn't look like that's on the table. Um, ethnicity we define as a, a self-identity with a group defined by racial admixture, so you can have an ethnic group of any group you like. There is no common phenotype uh, in an ethnic group. While race often, most often has some form, some common phenotype that can be identified. Uh, and it's supported by both uh, the uh, anthropology, genetic, and archaeological data that are, that are available. Um, 
And these sharing of non-phenotypic characteristics is typical, uh, is, uh, is sort of the defining char characteristic of an ethnic group. Um, there are, you know, issues with race, you know, is it a social construct, do we do genetic ancestry? And there is consensus among the scientific community, and we had actually a meeting last year with the Genome Institute around this time. Uh, we brought people together from across the country, and after a lot of discussion, you know, everyone agrees, this is a social construct. This is not something we're going to define, oh, you're only 22% African ancestry, so you can't call yourself black. Um, that's just not the way it is. We, it's a social construct. And we have these genetic ancestral tools that are interesting and that we should use as a tool. And maybe at some point in the future, uh, it'll be something that will be available to people in a clinical setting where you'll be able to act on, on some information uh, from that. But that's not yet to be done. There's an interesting issue with admixed populations. And by that I mean populations that because of history, have had generations of mixture, and Latin America is one of those laboratories where you've had 500 plus years of mixture of European and native people and some African, depending on the region, and even some Asian in some places. Hawaii is another example, and South Asia is probably another example of that with a mixture of uh, European ancestry or white ancestry and uh, African ancestry, uh, in, in, and a little bit, again, also of East Asian ancestry. And this issue of Asian race being defined by geography, I think, is, a, is, an, is an issue. Now, immigrants add diversity to our concept of race. In the U.S., for years, the issue of disparity was a white-black contrast. Uh, and until the 1960s, that generally held true. Um, there were not too, not, you know, there's some Mexicans out west, but not too many. Uh, and so you basically were able to do that, but that's changed. Our society is more diverse, there's been much more immigration, more uh, dispersion geographically around the country uh, with these immigrants, and so I think that's the other uh, issue. And I still believe, and I still, that this is a critical measure in human research and to advance knowledge and to actually know your patient. So I became, um, uh, it was interesting that at UCSF, my former academic institution, it became sort of the standard that students were taught not to present uh, the case with a description of someone's race, ethnicity. Uh, and because the idea was, that, oh, that introduces a bias. And there were studies that showed that residents were more likely to say the race only when there was a black patient uh, or someone who was uh, poor or a substance user, and they would say the race, and that reflected some bias. Uh, and as opposed to addressing that directly, it was decided, well, let's take it out. And, and I think that that was uh, actually a mistake, uh, but, and I would always ask them, and I would role model it, uh, I would always ask the patient uh, what, not only who, I could see what they were, where they were from, but also what they did, so they had some sense of their socioeconomic status. Um, I'm a believer in lumping, uh, both clinically in my life as a generalist, and also in this context, so if you start saying, well, you know, the Dominicans are different from the Cubans or from the Salvadorians and the Mexicans, and, and then we start getting into this splitting thing. And you can always look at fine granularity, but I think the lumping groups uh, allows uh, much more leverage in um, political influence. So health disparities then focuses on uh, not just the racial ethnic minorities, but also pe poor people of any race. Um, so poor whites are very much in our interest in, in, uh, at NIMHD. Uh, we were mandated to be interested in rural residents. I think most rural residents that we are interested in would either be poor or minority, but obviously that's a strategically good thing to have that in our mandate now. Uh, and I think there are unique issues about very, especially very rural areas that, that are relevant to our, our uh, scientific agenda. And last year we declared that sexual gender minorities were also a disparity population. I think primarily to really promote more research in this population, because right now we don't have the data for outcomes to say, oh, there's more diabetes or more, de di more depression. We just don't know national data. And I think we need to stimulate that. And actually I, didn't, I wasn't responsible for that, though I got all the credit. It came out of the office of the director, and we had to leverage that with the Department of Health and Human Services, and it, it worked out. Um, and so a disparity is, a pop is any of these groups that have a worse health outcome. 
that we believe is in part due, but not exclusively due to the social disadvantage and being underserved. But there are other factors that contribute. Uh, the fact that white men have more heart attacks is not a disparity, it's a difference. Uh, and that's just to bring, uh, bring home that point, that disparity is an adverse outcome in one of these population groups. Uh, the etiology may vary. Sometimes it's social, sometimes it's access, sometimes it's biology, sometimes it's behavior. We use these outcomes, which I won't dwell on, just to try to have some standardization about what we're comparing. Uh, I'm particularly interested in more data, more research on burden of disease as measured by something like the disability adjusted life years frequently used in global health, but not as often in the US. And there are actually, Chris Murray, who's at University of Washington, has been doing this work for some time and looking at county level uh, dollies, and in fact, uh, even stratified by race, ethnicity, and gender. Uh, there's still ongoing work that they're being done. And also uh, re uh, related to uh, patient um, or person reported measures. After all, we're in the business of health and science to make people feel better. Um, and, and do better, not just live longer. And so uh, daily functioning and health-related quality of life becomes very important to us as well. The topic of social class in clinical medicine or socioeconomic status is complex. And you know, we start from a point of view that in the United States, uh, the tradition had been that anyone could make it here, that we did not worry about class. Um, Europe was old and traditional and they had nobility and all that and they were more social class. I'm, I'm not referring to what any of you think, but it's just the history, that sort of uh, history that we carry uh, as being part of the United States. So the good things uh, come with, with some adverse things there. But it is important, and I'll show you the compelling data on that, but education I think is the easiest way to measure it. Income is problematic, you know, the Whitehall study in the UK that study the outcomes um, uh, of, uh, of people by their employment, and the most uh, autonomous and professional had the best outcomes, sort of reflects uh, social class and education. Um, similarly, in uh, dealing with children, we, we worry about life course SES. I mean, I'm sorry, with parental education, and, and life course SES or life course, how you grew up uh, is, a, is an unknown factor in studying, uh, research, in studying health outcomes. And so if you, let's say, take it for example, and, and this gets down to the issue of wealth. Um, if you take uh, two physicians, uh, let's say both cardiologists making X amount of money, both same education, but one physician comes from a third generation San Francisco homeowner where property values have doubled in the last, every 10 years more or less in the last uh, 30 or 40 years. And the other one is the first one in his family to go to, or her family to go to college. So income's the same, education's the same, status, occupation, but clearly the wealth, the assets in those individuals are very different. And I think that's where it gets at. And very hard to get to this uh, measure of SES. Some studies do, um, but very few do. And it's hard, but so I think education at least gets to some of that. These are data from the census, and if anyone questions, well, why bother asking about this in a clinical context? Uh, this is the, the relationship of all-cause all mortality in the U.S. by income in the household. Uh, and these are data from 2013. Uh, so if you're under the poverty level, under 25,000, you're three times more likely to die than if you make, your household makes 100, over $115,000. And $115,000 is not wealthy. Uh, certainly not in 2013 or this day and age. I mean, you're, you're okay, but you're not wealthy. And median income in the U.S. is 58,000 per more recent census report, so you can see it's still almost double the all-cause mortality. So this is a very powerful health predictor, uh, your social economic status or your social class. And that's one of the reasons we should all, in all disease entities, in all institutes at NIH, should be measuring this more routinely and, and looking at it. There are many other social determinants. I won't dwell on these. Um, from national background, geographic region, culture, religion, immigration, language proficiency, uh, literacy, numeracy. These are, again, uh, research tools that now we know how to measure and can actually implement in studies or look at in terms of care of patients. Uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, I mentioned that. And then uh, one that has also been relatively understudy is the history of incarceration, uh, which predominantly, of course, affects men of color in this country. And I think what that does to your health later on. And there could be others as well. 
I'm going to sidetrack to talk about Latinos, an area of special interest to me uh, for a moment. These are data from the national data from uh, a social demographic characteristics. If we think Latinos are sort of better off, there's some advantages, but you can look at poverty, whites, 11%, and then look at all the Latino groups. So even the Cubans, who are sort of the model group, if you wish, they've been called that, it's 20%. It's almost double what it is for whites. Um, African Americans are higher. Uh, percent limited English proficiency, expect that to be higher. Almost half of Central Americans had limited English proficiency. And look at uh, percent with less than high school education. Here, the Latinos uh, are ahead, particularly Central Americans and Mexican Americans. So these are adverse socioeconomic, social determinants of health. Low education, low income, no English, immigrant status. Yet we look at life expectancy, and look at this. Latina, Latino men have the longest life expectancy of the race ethnic groups in the US. And Latino women, you know, they're just off the charts. They're up, you know, they're not as high as Japan, but they're getting there. 84. So what's that about? And you say, well, it's the immigrants are better. Well, it's only 48% are immigrants. Uh, more than half of the Latinos now are born in the US. So this isn't going away, is the point. So a lot of news uh, a year and a half ago about whites losing life expectancy. All of the effect on loss of life expectancy was poor whites. Uh, it was a pure, it was a strictly a socioeconomic uh, relationship, not a race thing. Um, it was all socioeconomics. And what, and the difference for blacks, and this is between 2000 and 2015, and I'll show you the chart, was that the gain in life expectancy for African Americans exceeded expectations. So in those 15 years, it went from 2% per year, that was the projection by demographers in the year 2000, to 4% per year. Uh, and so we're doing some things right, uh, it's slow, the progress is slow, and most of us are eager to see uh, faster improvement, uh, but, uh, but there is uh, some uh, optimism there. Uh, the data for American Indian, Alaska Native, and Native Hawaiians is not good. Um, this is not published by census yet. They're still working on sort of the precision of it. Their statisticians are really uh, strict, uh, and they're also similarly working on national data for Asian um, life expectancy, and they're very slow in releasing these data. They sat on the Latino Hispanic life expectancy data for years before they released them because they really wanted to make sure it was right. But this is taken from a presentation by Elizabeth Arias. So, so this epidemiologic paradox is intriguing. Um, adverse social factors, yet better uh, outcomes in certain diseases, longer life expectancy. And it's been at the heart of some of the research that I was doing in, uh, in San Francisco, and I still am able to do at NIH, and it is an area of interest to NIMHD uh, and should be to others as well. Maybe behavior has something to do with it. We can see in smoking from uh, 2014, this uh, difference by race, ethnicity. You see the Latinos are low. Asian women are even lower uh, than uh, Latino women or men. Um, and the Asian immigrants uh, tend to smoke when they're uh, living outside the U.S. and then they quit in large numbers when they arrive in the U.S. Again, a phenomenon that has not been well studied. Um, and even for blacks, uh, black women have, have dropped quite a bit. White women have highest, but African American men are the highest. More of an education gradient in tobacco use than there is in race uh, ethnic difference. But look at the white, um, the black white mortality curves from 1999 to 2015. These are taken directly from the MMWR report. And two things I'll point out here. Um, these curves are kind of narrow here so to, 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 for you to see much. One is in people over 65, there's now been a crossover. So there's either no difference or actually African Americans do a little bit better when they get to 65 in terms of life expectancy. So what's that about? Um, and nobody's, maybe quality of life isn't as good. I think there's some data that says that. But boy, this is a, this is a big gain here. And we don't know what this is about. There, uh, maybe it has something to do with cognitive impairment survival or Alzheimer's disease survival. I don't know. And then there's gap, this is where the biggest gap is in this 50 to 64. And we haven't narrowed that gap very much uh, in these 15 years. And this is the age group where uh, uh, patients get strokes early because they have not well controlled high blood pressure, they end up getting with diabetic complications because it's not been well controlled, or they get an early cancer that's more aggressive, not detected early enough, and they die. So this is, I think, an area that we, need, that we would need to do uh, more research on to improve and decrease that gap. Analysis from the NIH intramural program at cancer, actually, at NCI, 
published this in Lancet earlier this year, and looking at premature mortality, so they discount anybody who's over 65, um, but a, a premature mortality has actually gone down in the US uh, in all minority groups, Latinos, Blacks, and Asians, by these significant numbers, primarily related to improvements in HIV disease treatment, we can now control it with one pill. Um, a cancer treatment has made major advances in some cancers in particular, but uh, there are major advances and more to come. And then the continued improvement in heart disease, although that seems to now be uh, plateauing more. Um, but whites um, and American Indian and Alaska Native did worse, and it's from accidental overdose, chronic liver disease or cirrhosis, and uh, suicide all related to untreated mental health or poorly treated mental health and substance use. And this is where the opioid epidemic has taken its toll over these 15 years. And actually not only poor whites, but also American Indians have a disproportionate share of both of these elements. Again, we are interested in that and those as issues. American Indians have the highest mortality, premature mortality, and then blacks are actually second in, in this analysis. If you look at suicide rates, we see these interesting, well, uh, it's tragic, but see this observation that unlike you see for many other causes of death and disability, uh, the, the three of the four minority groups, blacks, Asians, and Latinos, all have significantly lower rates of suicide. Um, you know that men commit complete suicide much more frequently than women do, uh, but these, these relationships hold uh, across gender. Uh, and you see that for whites, there's been a significant increase over the course of these, uh, not quite 15 years, and for American Indians, it's even worse. Um, and what's behind this? I don't know. I've talked to Josh Gordon, the director of NIMH, because I don't know, you know, what, why, why do we see this difference? And this is a, it's a laboratory for inquiry and discovery. And it, we could say, uh, oh, if we have an obvious social or access explanation that you could say, well, we can test it, we can develop empirical evidence, but a lot of these issues don't. And so we're looking for the interaction effects to try to, to find those. Um, trends in stroke death, again, improvement. You see the big decrease for African Americans uh, in all groups, actually, for that matter. Um, and, uh, and except for, of course, African Americans continue to have a disproportionate share of stroke. The other groups are all within ballpark, with uh, minority groups actually being less than, than, uh, than, uh, than whites. Um, mention racism and discrimination because uh, it's not the uh, elephant in the room. It's actually a real problem. Um, I, I must say that moving from west to east, I've experienced that more viscerally and more, uh, you know, in day-to-day -day living and reading the newspaper. Maybe the times, the current times are bringing that out, but I think it's also the setting uh, is different and, uh, and, and I see that difference. And most of the racism work that we have done, we meaning scientists, has been in this area, the interpersonal one, David Williams, Nancy Krieger, others have developed very validated, excellent scales on perceived discrimination, um, data, the, the everyday discrimination scale, a variety of other measures that can be administered in, in research settings or in clinical settings for that matter. And there's you know, good work done in this, developed associations have been established, mostly with process outcomes, not with hard outcomes. So, uh, maybe cardiovascular reactivity, blood pressure goes up, uh, but no uh, linkage to outcomes yet. Uh, but there are good measures to do that, and that's where most of it. You ask someone, have you been discriminated? Uh, structural racism is uh, a construct that uh, coming to NIH, I said, is this, uh, is this a, a, a research construct, or are we talking about a systems construct? Is this something that, uh, that you walk into a place and you feel like, oh, Nobody looks like me is, uh, except behind the desk or the custodians. And so you feel like out of place. Is that, that's like structural racism or the structural racism of living in segregated neighborhoods or living in a neighborhood where there are more liquor stores uh, than anywhere else and there's no full service grocery store, for example. All these are structural things. Um, we had a workshop to discuss all this in May and uh, my program staff have, con you know, uh, followed up and convinced me that there are, this, is a re this can be and is a research construct. You have to be creative and innovative in how you uh, use it, and there were some good examples presented. And we hope to promote this uh, research by having an, probably initially some sort of a, a special um, uh, journal issue where we ask for, uh, for uh, articles. And then the hardest one is this internalized uh, racism. is how discrimination affects you 
but you ask the person, have you been discriminated against? And the answer is no. Uh, but they have lived an experience where they have suffered that, and yet and their body is physiologically reacting. So think of racism or discrimination as a form of chronic stress. Uh, and what the body reacts to in that way. And I think that allows us to think about it. And you say, well, how common is it? This is from uh, Kaiser Foundation, a survey of Americans. It was updated in November 2015. Um, and they ask, in the past 30 days, were you treated unfairly because of race or ethnic background in a variety of settings, including healthcare? So the first column is anywhere. Um, 53% of African Americans in this national survey said they were treated unfairly in some setting in the last month, not ever, in the last month. So this is real. Uh, we can't ignore this. And then a third, over a third of Latinos uh, answered affirmative to that. Now we do a lot better in healthcare, but it's still 12, 14% are saying it's happening to them in the healthcare setting. Um, lots of uh, you know, effervescence and, and, and movement in the scientific world on measures. So I have colleagues talk about a scientific new development, you know, extracellular R RNA or the brain imaging stuff, and, and, and nobody has yet said, okay, well, how does it differ by race ethnicity? Oh, we don't know. We, we're, just, we're just working with mice right now. Or we're, we're just getting the measures right right now. So I think that has tremendous opportunity in the next few years to link the biological pathways uh, to many of the social constructs uh, and, and uh, population science that we have learned about over the last um, several decades. Um, and I think that the field is really ready for this. This is just a list of some of the areas that have been published on, um, you know, both the standard physiologic measures that you're familiar with, the cortisol axis, which I learned about in medical school, is certainly not new, inflammation, allostatic load, uh, telomere length, sleep is a turn, you know, uh, Nora Volkow talks about how you sleep, when you sleep, you wash the brain. Uh, and uh, somebody says, well, that's what we should tell all adolescents, eh? you've got to wash your brain every night, um, get enough sleep. And how, how does that relate to your health long term? And it's not talking about, oh, I'm tired or I can't concentrate or uh, I'm talking about disease. Uh, and what does that do to, to your long term health? And understanding those pathways becomes, I think, the, the science of what we do. I've tried to capture this in the next two slides, sort of really to transmit these dimensions, both the individual ones that I alluded to already, all these biological processes, the microbiome is another one, different metabolic differences. And I'll give you a quick example. In liver cancer, when we looked at this and we put out a funding opportunity announcement, in, in, we found that you know, in, in Asian populations, it's hepatitis B. That's the predominant cause. We looked at, uh, at African Americans, and it's a male-female uh, difference. Men have much more liver cancer, two, three times more than women do. And we looked at African American men, and it wasn't hep B or C as the only explanation. Um, we look at Mexicans, they, Mexican Americans have you know, very low rates of hepatitis B and hepatitis C. So what's, what's, it, what's a cause for them? Is it obesity? Is it the fat, the hypothesis? And so I think there's opportunity here to, you know, same outcome to learn about mechanisms when you use the different populations as a laboratory to try and study pathways uh, that will then eventually, uh, you know, hep B isn't easy. We have a vaccine, we can, we, can, we can actually decrease liver cancer as Taiwan has done by effectively vaccinating the entire population and we should see similar impact in the U.S. for hep B related uh, liver cancer. Physical environment, uh, the built environment, the neighborhood, the social structure, all of these matter. Um, you know, there's a saying about the genetic code, or the zip code is more important to your health than the genetic code, and it's true. Um, it's a little oversimplification, perhaps, but the physical environment is really a, a, an area of research that really emerged in the last 20 years. How do we link that to the cultural environment, the fact that if you talk to people, you have better health. Uh, you know, we know that social support is important in, in, in longevity and in better outcomes. And yet, uh, how, what is, how does that translate to communities and, and social capital and social cohesion? And this is all area of active research. And last but not least, the clinical setting. Uh, NIH 
clinical research has mostly been clinical trials or cohort studies, observational studies. And I'm interested that we study it in MHD with our limited resources. What goes on every day in practice between a patient and their clinician, uh, whether it be in the clinic or in the hospital or in the emergency room? And around, of course, minority health, health disparities. So health services matters, but also qualitative information, qualitative or patient-doctor communication type of uh, research. We put this framework on our website to uh, sort of transmit this to our grantees, particularly around the centers program that we recently uh, awarded new, uh, 12 new awards on, just to capture this and to give uh, investigators a sense uh, of what we mean. And I think it helps as a guide. It's, it's available there. Some examples of place. Um, a group of economists at Stanford published a paper, very high profile in JAMA, a little over a year ago where they talked about the life expectancy inequality gap uh, varying from 10 to 14 years, 10 years for women, 14 for men, from the bottom 1% to the top 1% in income. So not new information, you know, just that the inequality is there, maybe it's not only persisting, but maybe getting worse. The fascinating bit of data from that paper and that analysis was that they found that some communities, the bottom quintile of their patient, of their population, sorry, in, uh, in, in, uh, by income, live three to four and a half years longer than other communities. And just to put it in real terms, Birmingham versus Detroit. Um, and, and, and what is Birmingham doing right that leads to better outcomes? I, I don't know, I don't have the answer to that. I think the scientists need, we need to figure out what, what are communities doing well uh, that lead to better outcomes, and that's not been uh, well shown. And, and other issues around rural areas, which I won't dwell on for the uh, sake of time. Uh, infant mortality, we've made progress. The U.S. doesn't do as well as other high-income countries, but you can see that for both uh, black and Puerto Ricans, it had the highest rates. Uh, there's been substantial decreases. American Indians also don't do as well, and their, their progress has been less, uh, uh, not, not as palpable, but uh, overall, infant mortality is rate. There, has there ever been a randomized trial of OB care? Does anyone? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, um, it, but we know what to do, right? Because it's something that we do in prenatal care and in OB care works because infant mortality has been going down, 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 down for 100, 100 plus years. Uh, some of it's social, some of it's medical, um, but, and, and in behavior related to uh, substance use, particularly tobacco. Um, I mentioned this already, the racially admixed populations provide per perhaps an opportunity to look at some particular topic in a more um, a vertical way. Uh, I've been doing that with Latin America, but I think there are opportunities with the other group. Um, the ancestral markers um, have been used to identify uh, racial uh, groups, uh, geographically origin groups. And if you look at this, about 21% of all SNPs are unique to a particular group. African origin or African ancestry have the greatest heterogeneity. It's a sort of additional evidence that uh, humans as we know them today originated in East Africa. Um, and in somewhere all of us came from Africa. I mean, that's really, that's what the, uh, the compelling data support that uh, through the uh, founder populations that are traced to mitochondrial DNA. And you have seen these maps of migrations out of Africa, but this is all supported by the genetic ancestry. And then how does this interact with the environment and get the gene expression? Because it clearly, if you carry a gene, doesn't mean you're going to get the outcome that that's associated with. You have to have expression. You have to have some interaction with the environment and your behavior. Uh, I'll show you a couple of uh, examples. This is some lung cancer. Uh, lung cancer is uh, disproportionately high in African Americans, uh, and this is uh, in men, um, considerably higher. And you say, well, they smoke more. They don't. Uh, but and then the uh, multi-ethnic cohort study in uh, California and Hawaii recruited a large number of uh, diverse uh, participants uh, of all these different eth ethnic racial groups, 45 to 75, over the course of time, uh, over 10 years. Uh, uh, cases of uh, 1,979 cases of lung cancer, and African Americans were used as a reference group and stratified by smoking intensity, so number of cigarettes per day. And the chart I'll show you uh, will show the relative risk of lung cancer by race ethnicity within smoking level, and this was uh, in the New England Journal about a decade ago. So if you look at the Afri African American reference group here, Hawaiians are not statistically less, although their point estimates are lower. 
but Latinos, Japanese, and whites all had significantly lower risk, relative risk, of lung cancer for the same level of smoking intensity. So why is that? Uh, I, I don't have the answer, but this, this is a, uh, published now a number of years ago. We don't know the cause, and I'll share some speculation. Uh, same carcinogen, you know, tobacco is 85% of attributable risk of lung cancer. Uh, ascertained cases of cancer through SEER and, you know, un unequivocal cases. Observational, so they measured the smoking history before uh, the cases developed. And you see dramatic differences in development of cancer by this crude uh, variable of social construct of race uh, or ethnicity. So isn't that interesting? Um, breast cancer has uh, some other aspects of it. You see with Latinas, have lower risk of breast cancer. Um, uh, Laura Fehrman, working uh, with a lot Ziv and others in, uh, in, in UCSF and, uh, and in California, uh, discovered a, an, estrogen recept an estrogen allele in the estrogen receptor uh, area, sorry, um, and, and new, uh, not a new gene, but a gene in the estrogen receptor area of, uh, in a case control design and found <clears throat> through uh, this study that about an odds ratio of about 0.6 uh, protection against lung, uh, breast cancer. So keep in mind that it started with the epidemiology that we've known for years, uh, lower risk of breast cancer, and we couldn't explain it on the basis of risk factors. Oh, not, it's, it's uh, low, less detection because they don't have access. Well, we, we, we addressed that. Oh, they're not getting mammograms. Oh, they are getting mammograms. So, we look, so the, the discovery of that gene was because of the epidemiology that pointed into let's look for something else. And, and they found something, uh, and it was uh, published in Nature Communication. What, what does this imply? What, what, what are the learning lessons from it? I, I don't know yet. Maybe some days it'll have therapeutic implications. I don't know. But that gene is present in 15% of women who have uh, indigenous a a ancestry. Uh, and it's only present in women of Latina, in, uh, Latina women who have American indigenous ancestry. So it's not found in other parts of the world per the, you know, the, the database that are available. Um, on the issue of diversity in the population, and I'm losing track of where I am on my talk, but I'll, 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 this is too important to pack past, especially with Joan here. Um, this is really an urgent issue. I'm switching gears here. Uh, we have a crisis in the professions uh, that in, in a short period of time will have professionals in science and in clinical care and biomedical workforce that will look very different from our, our population. And, and we have to address this more uh, urgently than we have. So when I started, uh, and others who started in the early 1980s, uh, you know, it was about you know, maybe 5% uh, of all doctors were Latino or African American. Now it's a whopping 11%. We can't wait another you know, 40 years, 35 years to see this change. Um, and uh, a good number of these Latinos who graduate uh, in 2014 per AAMC uh, are come from Puerto Rico. Uh, so it's not even, U it's a U.S. territory, but uh, it's not part of the U.S. mainstream medical schools. We have good empirical evidence that minority doctors are more likely to see uninsured Medicaid patients and have greater intent to work in underserved areas. On the research side, um, it's five to seven percent, maybe, if you want to be generous, have NIH R01 grants awarded to African American and Latino PIs. There's apparent bias in funding for African American uh, scientists that is being looked at. This is the Donna Ginter's paper in Science a few years ago. Hannah Valentine has looked at this very uh, detailed, actually, the Office of Extramural Research at NIH. And they're, they're, they're working on the, uh, on the paper, actually, on this. It's an uh, advanced draft. Uh, it's not explainable. Now, one of the explanations is this idea that uh, uh, African Americans are more likely to apply in low success topics. Um, and low success topics are community health, minority health, diabetes, hypertension, things that, uh, that motivates and interests them. But the, the number of applications are actually quite small for both blacks and Latinos. There's just no bias in the Latino applicants that there is in the African Americans. And Hannah has designed a couple of studies to look at this. Um, I think this potentially is part of the answer. The, we, we had a, a research center for minority aging research out of the NIA. 
Uh, they've been funding this now for 20 years. The, uh, there's a new uh, our, a funding opportunity announcement that's out and they're, they're being reviewed soon. Uh, we looked at this experience with 266 funded scholars. That's where many of my 70 came from <laughs> that you mentioned earlier. This is the race ethnic breakdown. 18 of them had been awarded R01 or equivalent a large foundation grant uh, when we wrote this up and over the course of 97 to 15. And the pathway that I think we were finding is we would give them pilot money, you know, $20,000, $30,000 to do a project. We'd retain them for a year or two. But we really said, well, we have to do lifetime mentoring. We have to stick with them and, and continue to mentor them. Um, and then they would apply for a diversity supplement uh, off of our center grant or of someone's R grant. Um, and then they would go for a K. And uh, obviously, we did pick some people who were on the road to success to, uh, to, to, to make the grants look good. But uh, a lot of this was people who otherwise would not have gone anywhere uh, in research. And, and some of it were people we took chances on. And some of those also did well. And so this long-term mentoring, I think, turned out to be a, a critical piece. And we used the model of going to successful research sites. We, I didn't say we. NIA did use this model. So these grants went to University of Michigan, University of Alabama, UCSF, UCLA. Um, uh, I think Penn had one. Columbia had one at one point. So they didn't go to the low resource institutions. And it's not a matter of either or. I think strat the strategy has to be both. We have to work on both ends of the, of the spectrum on, on these cases. So let me finish with some sort of more um, experiential uh, thoughts. Um, and this is targeting more, more the trainees here, uh, uh, as opposed to those of you uh, with uh, more experience. Um, I think the mission and vision really matter in biomedical sciences. And when, when things get hard, you, know, you have to really go back to, why are you doing this? You know, you're doing this for improving health, for helping patients, or for advancing knowledge. I mean, that really is what motivates people. And it's, it's, a, it's really a valued uh, component. It's, and running a unit, uh, a heterogeneous unit for that, um, in academics, not less heterogeneous, now more, uh, that's really a, a, just a way to motivate people and get people to work together. There's no other uh, way out of that. Um, really value your investment in training. I think the, the precious time that a, a, a research fellow has to actually do research unobstructed uh, in those early years of assistant professor when people aren't calling you to do 20 things most of the time uh, are really important to give you that foundation to do that research, to get that training, to get that knowledge in what you're doing. Uh, I always as a physician thought that leveraging my clinical skills was really uh, a, a, an essential part of my identity. Uh, it helped me uh, when I helped people find doctors or when I was able to be the doctor for uh, faculty or for referrals or for people from the community uh, and, and to use. So I would tell anyone in medicine uh, or in health, direct health care services not to give that up. Uh, really focus on finishing projects. The hardest thing I, you know, and I always have been guilty of that too, but in a, as a young investigator, you can't afford not to finish. And what happens is I think I see you, you do the research, you get it done, you get all excited, you have the results, and you know, they're, they're, not, they're not like a New England Journal paper so, or JAMA. Or, you know, they're not like, start, oh, I'm going to change. And you go, oh, I, I, and then you just forget that you don't write it up. And I, or you write it up very slowly, and then it takes time. And writing is actually um, the most relevant and, and hardest skill for an investigator to learn to do well. Now, some people are gifted and can do and write very well, no problems. But most uh, clinician scientists uh, forget how to write in, in, their, in their training. You know, in, in medical school and, and in, um, in uh, residency, you just, you know, you write in code, right? You put all abbreviations and, and you, you, don't, you don't have complete sentences. You don't know what a topic sentence is. You don't know paragraph. I mean, it's just a mess. So, but it's a learnable skill and you can get good at it. Uh, it just takes work, that's all. Uh, and that's what I think some of the, and then be aware of the valued currency in academics. You know, it's scholarship and quality patient care and teaching and national visibility. You can't lose the eye on that. And, and then defining your values uh, and, and sticking by your values, which I would say include humanism and social justice um, and integrity in what you do, um, uh, both in research and in, in caring for patients and teaching. Um, 
I think these are test, uh, place and time tested strategies, you know, collaborative leadership team. Um, I, I come now from NIH where authority is important, there's a lot more top-down hierarchy, but I really value collaborative leadership and how to balance that is now my new challenge in, in NIH, but clearly it's, it's essential for growth uh, of both research teams and units in, in, these, in many settings. Uh, decisions, of course, still need to be made and you have to own those regardless of outcomes. I, I, it's one of the things I, I, I dislike the most about a leader is when, when something goes wrong, they look the other way. They blame someone else or oh, it was the system or was this, you know, you may not have been responsible for what happened, but yet, if you're in charge, you've got to own it. And that's true for patient care, it's true for your research. Uh, and it's true for anything to do with uh, how a unit functions, and I think that will take you a long way. Uh, avoiding conflict is the most common thing people do. They'd like to, you know, they, they, they really uh, kind of run away from it, and, and that's, uh, sometimes it works, but most of the time it doesn't. It'll just rot. So you have to address it uh, in some way, uh, the conflict, and I think this is all part of uh, being a problem solver, and, and in leadership it's really important. Um, when we train folks coming out of Harvard, uh, UCSF, um, to do science, to do clinical care, to do both, you have to face the fact that you're going to be leaders. It's part of what you have to be. Whether you lead your practice, whether you lead a clinic, whether you lead a, uh, a, an academic unit, a research project, a lab, it, it doesn't, you're going to be in a leadership role. That's, what we, that's why you're here. Uh, and you have to step into that and embrace it and figure out all these, these strategies that don't come with uh, medical school curriculum. Uh, well, I guess they do now, but uh, they didn't when I was uh, training. And then uh, always think about mistakes and uh, learning to say I'm sorry, because it will always uh, be helpful to you in what you do. And even if you, in your heart of hearts, know that you didn't do anything wrong, uh, frequently, yeah, you're, you're in a situation where you need to do that in order to move forward and not stick to, uh, to something. So I'll stop with that, and uh, I don't know, if, Joan, if there's time for any questions, but if there are, I'm happy to entertain. Thank you.